book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Doris and I were talking about some things this afternoon and one of the reflections Doris made is how when you get past a situation or past certain things and you look back on that, the, the sight that you have or the hindsight that twenty is always twenty twenty once you're past the situations. And sometimes we wish we could go back and we can say things a certain way or we could do things a little bit differently or wish that God would give us an opportunity to do one more thing to correct or whatever. But God gives you that understanding and that insight for a reason as you go forward that we might be able to take and apply and I was thinking about that, and as I was praying through what God would have me to preach on tonight, God brought me back to the last message that I preached there at Love's Chapel a little over a month ago. I've been meditating and musing on that same message here out of Matthew 5 for quite a while now. And so because God's kept it on my heart, I want to share it with you tonight as I, as I attempt to try to preach and deliver something out of God's Word. But Here in Matthew 5, we'll begin in verse 1 and go down through several verses here in this passage of Scripture. Verse 1 reads, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if we take those first ten verses there and we begin to look at what we often call the Beatitudes, what I want us to look at in particular tonight is that verse 9 where it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So I began to study that before, and as I've continued to meditate on that and trying to begin to understand what God's Word is calling our attention to in that passage of Scripture, when I first began to study it, my whole perspective was changed, and as I've continued to study it, my whole perspective continues to change and be transformed. There's an idea of peace in this world that God does not give to God's people. There's an idea of peace that we seek after or that we we give to other individuals or we seek from other individuals that's not a peace that comes from God. There's There's an idea of peace that in giving that peace, what man is really doing and trying to be that kind of peacemaker is what they are doing is they are avoiding or they are appeasing or they are operating out of fear or they're operating out of control And yet they think in their eyes that that is giving a type of peace to a person that they're speaking with or or to the people that they're interacting with. But there's a peace that God says that He gives, and that's the only peace that we as a people of God have to offer whenever we are going about as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, doing what God's Word says in being a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who's not delivering peace itself, but doing what's necessary that the person that we're interacting with might have peace. And it's the peace that God gives. It's the peace that comes as we walk in obedience to Him in His kingdom. It's the peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that is supernatural, not a peace that is temporary, not a peace that is carnal, not a peace that's filled with emotions, a peace that comes from God, and it is based on the truth of God's Word. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall, as it says there in that passage of Scripture, They shall be called the children of God. In this world and in this this day that we live in, go back with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. There are all sorts of peace that's being offered out in this day. Whether we're talking about major decisions that we're making and we're we're desiring to have peace, the, the wisdom of God is first pure, and as James goes on and says there, it's peaceable. And so whenever we're making major decisions, when you young adults are looking for the spouse that you're going to marry, you need to be seeking after the peace of God to help you have to know that you have the wisdom that you need to know if this is the man or the woman that you're going to marry. And God is going to place people, other believers in your path, who are either going to be peacemakers or they're going to be troublemakers. I guarantee you the troublemakers are going to be the ones who are going to tell you things that make you feel good about yourself, 
They're going to be people who tell you things that you want to hear. They're not going to love you enough to tell you things that's going to make peace in your life. Here in Jeremiah, that's what's happened in this passage of Scripture with the people of God. Look with me in Jeremiah, beginning in verse 11, chapter 6, verse 11. It says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the age with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. Do you hear what's being said in that passage of Scripture? There's all kinds of false teachings, covetousness, troubles and struggles, and, and God is angry with the situation that's going on. His, his fury in that the, the prophet, the priest there, is angry with what's going on. And as we read on down in this passage of Scripture, pick up there with me, just jump down to verse, yes, to pick up in verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. What that's getting at is they've attempted to say things that's going to heal the hurt. Yeah. They've said things that's going to make people feel okay, but they've only done it slightly because the peace that the world or those that are not willing to deal with God's word, that peace that they are attempting to offer you only covers you temporarily. It's going to raise up your emotions. It's going to give you a popular opinion. It's going to give you something that makes you feel good, but only slightly. Give it a day or so. Give it the next time you have to face the same kind of situation, and you'll find that that peace did not sustain you. But listen to what the priests are saying. Listen to what the people are saying in verse 14. Saying, peace, peace. They're going to say things and describe what they're saying as though it is a deliverance of peace. When there is no peace. They're saying peace, peace. When there is no peace. If we're not careful, we do that very thing. If we're not careful, when someone comes to us. And they're sharing with us something in their life. And they may not even be struggling with what they're dealing with. And yet we hear what they're saying and what they're doing. And what they're, what's going on in their life. What we hear them saying and doing does not align with the word of God. And we say nothing that's equivalent to saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Because if we, as a people of God, understand that if we continue down the path, or if they continue down the path that they are going in, it is not a path of peace, but one of destruction and perishing. And God's given you and I, as a people of God, the opportunity to speak words of truth. And when we speak words of truth, it's truth. It's God's Word. And it's the obedience to God's Word that brings about real peace. We have an idea that peace is this feeling amongst us as a people of God. It's this feeling within us. And so you have all kinds of false doctrines we were looking at. We've been looking at the book of Jude in our Bible study class. And, and it says that we as the people of God are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints because there's going to be men who come in and they creep in and, and, and give all kinds of damnable heresies and false doctrine and and, I, and I, I said, Brother Billy asked the question this morning, and it really stuck with me about what would be the false doctrine that Satan would try to bring into this church, a church that's well grounded in the doctrines of God's Word. And it would not be someone who would try to come in and say, it's time for us to all learn about accepting Jesus Christ into our heart to be saved eternally. You would reject that kind of doctrine immediately. It would be things that would appeal to your situation and to your emotions that make you think that feels better. It feels better sometimes to sit back and do absolutely nothing. It feels better sometimes in our flesh to, to, for someone to say, oh, don't worry about that. You're going to be okay. And what we're doing is we're elevating ourselves. We're elevating the emotions. We're elevating our personal opinion above the Word of God. And we're exercising ourselves just as Eve and Adam exercised themselves in the Garden of Eden whenever they eight of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of evil, that they might be like God themselves, knowing good and evil. And whenever we don't walk according to the word of God, or we don't speak the truth of God's word to someone, regardless of what we're saying, or what they're saying, or, or what we're hearing from them, we're not creating peace. We're acting as though we know better than God himself. 
Jesus Christ being the perfect example of a peacemaker. Did he go about in all the places that he went and, and, uh, and whenever he left that place, everyone just felt hunky-dory? They felt perfectly fine. That's not the example that Jesus gave. Go with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 10 and let's look at Jesus in this passage of Scripture. And Jesus is the perfect example of being a peacemaker. Everywhere he went, he went about making peace. And that's a true statement about Jesus Christ. But it's the kind of peace that the world says is causing trouble. That's where my mind began, as I studied this out, began to flip and change with my understanding of what it means to be a peacemaker. And I don't think I'll ever be able to go back to the idea that a peacemaker is someone who makes you feel good about, where, about, feel good about things. It's not going to leave you with this feeling of peace in your heart. A peacemaker is someone who's going to give you the truth of God's word whether you want to hear it or not. Matthew chapter 10, let's begin reading in verse 34. It says, Think not, Jesus speaking here, Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Let's take that for a second. If we're going to be peacemakers and someone's walking or thinking or living their life in some kind of way that's contrary to what God's word says, and we don't talk about that with them, we don't share and disciple with them and give them God's truth in place of what they're doing, they're going to lose their life. They're not going to have peace. God did not come. Jesus did not come into this world so that you and I would always feel good toward each other. He came in this world that He might divide us so that we don't elevate one another, that we don't elevate our own personal feelings, that we don't elevate your opinion or my opinion, we don't elevate popular opinion above Jesus Christ. And Jesus says... Blessed are the peacemakers. They're the ones. The peacemakers are the ones who are called the children of God. We can think quickly about Matthew 7, 21. We know that verse very well. Not everyone who calleth me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. There are lots of Christians today who are, who are professing Christianity, and yet they're not peacemakers. If we use that verse in Matthew 5, then they're not called children of God. Because a peacemaker is not someone who's come to make everything feel good. A peacemaker is someone who's not going to go about saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. A peacemaker is someone who's going to be willing and who's going to be faithful and who's going to be diligent and who's going to earnestly contend for the reality of the truth of God's word, the faith, in the life of everyone that they come in contact with that that person might walk according to the course of God's Word and in relationship with Jesus Christ, and then and only then will there be peace in the heart and the mind of that individual. Jesus came not to make relationships feel better. If that's the case, He came to divide those relationships so that we might have real life, that we might have real peace as found in Him and only Him. There's examples that we can use in God's Word. Matthew 21 don't turn there. I want to go to Stephen as an example in a second. But Matthew 21, you remember this passage of Scripture. You know, Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker, the perfect example of a peacemaker. And he goes into the temple of all places. The temple is supposed to be a place where everybody feels great. Everybody's just getting along with each other. There shouldn't be struggles and, and those kind of things. And Jesus goes in and he sees the error that's going on in his day. He sees people in the temple of God, the house of prayer, the house of worship, selling and exchanging money and doing things that are ungodly and, and forbidden and not right in the house of God. And Jesus, as the peacemaker, walks in there and he begins to flip over tables and to upbraid them and to begin to speak truth. And it made the Pharisees and the people around him angry. But those who received, those who heard, just like us today when someone begins to speak truth to us and you young adults who are going to get married or us older adults who are making majors, it doesn't matter what, you've got a decision before you and someone comes to you and they begin to give you the truth of God's word and it makes you angry, 
you're saying, I don't want peace. I want to feel good. We're elevating our feelings above Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, I know for a fact, personal experience, it always leads to a lack of peace. Anger and fear and loneliness and the judgment and the perishing, you'll lose your life. Jesus flipped over the tables. He upbraided the people as a peacemaker. Stephen, you can go there if you want to in the book of Acts. You know that passage of Scripture as well, Stephen in Acts chapter 7. I'm not going to read the passage because it's a long passage, but yeah, I do want to read a passage, a verse out of it. Go to Acts chapter 7. Stephen is a man full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, faithful man of God. He's there with the people of God making peace. And the way that he makes peace in that particular day is he begins to preach a, a message to the people that's surrounding him. <coughs> if you track in the scriptures, it's very similar to a message that Peter preached just a few, few chapters earlier in the book of Acts. There's a lot of similarities in the message that they preach. When Peter preaches that message of peace, the people respond by saying, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And, and there's 3,000 added to the church, and there's baptism. They're, they're pricked in their heart, and they desire to do what they experience, the peace of God, as Peter delivered the truth of God's word to them. Stephen here in this particular chapter is preaching the message of Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. And as he's preaching, he begins to make peace with the very people who's listening to him. Start with me in verse 51. Listen to the peace that he's making. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Does that sound like, feel like words of peace? Those are great words of peace. Because what Stephen is doing in that passage of Scripture is beginning to deliver to these men and these people standing here the truth that they need to know and to hear. One of the reasons that we do not, that we are not good peacemakers as the people of God today is because we're afraid. We do go for appeasement. We go for opinion. We go for feelings ahead of Jesus Christ being in the hearts and minds of us and them. And because we're afraid that we might hurt someone's feelings, because we're afraid that we might um, break off a relationship, because we're afraid of things, we go for the control of the situation, thinking that we can manage it much better than God by not telling him what God's Word says. Stephen, in his effort to make peace here, he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised people, you do always err just as your fathers did. Listen to the response of the people. This is often the response that we'll get as we go about making peace. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers in Matthew 5, for they shall be called the children of God. We're going to go back to that passage in just a moment in Matthew 5. But as Peter's making peace, listen to how the people respond to the peacemaking that he's doing. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now in Peter's preaching, it says they were pricked in the heart. And this passage says they were cut to the heart. A different kind of connotation. They didn't like what they were hearing. And it says this, And they gnashed on him with their teeth. There was no peace in their hearts and minds. But why? Did Stephen speak something that was not true? Stephen spoke truth. And the truth is what cuts away. The truth is what separates us from those things that are robbing us from the real peace that's in Jesus Christ. The truth is what sets us free from the very things that's holding us captive that we might not be able to access Jesus Christ and have the peace that's found in Him and Him alone. Stephen gives that truth and the people in their captivity, in the error of their way, they gnash on Stephen with their teeth. They get angry with what they're hearing him say as he prays and he looks up to heaven and go on down to verse 40, 57. Now it says, they, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And that don't sound like fun, does it? I thought Matthew 5 says, blessed are the peacemakers. Stephen doesn't sound blessed if we're thinking like the world. But if we think like the Word of God tells us to think, if we think with the, the mind of Christ, 
There's nothing that those men who are there who are gnashing on him with their teeth, there's nothing that they have, there's nothing that they possess that can give Stephen peace. It's only Christ. And there was nothing that Stephen had that he could give to them that would create peace in them other than Christ. And so in his faithfulness, he preached Jesus Christ to them. He didn't worry about how they might react. He didn't stop short. He didn't say, now, Jesus wants you to be saved. He said, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. And you're a stiff-necked and uncircumcised people because you resist the very one who can save you, who has saved you, who can save you from this error that you're walking in. There's so many of us who walk in error whenever we go about the course of the week and we're affected by this world, whenever we neglect our wives, when we elevate something in this world ahead of what God says we're supposed to have Him as preeminent, Him and, and the priorities that He's placed. And I, I need, I need the brethren around me who are peacemakers. I don't need someone who's going to tickle my ears and who's going to engage with my heart and leave it just as empty, though it might feel better temporarily, yet leave it just as empty as it was whenever I began to speak to them. Because I know how wicked my heart is, and I know how fast I'll run after the things of this world. And I don't need a placator, I need a peacemaker. God's people do not need placators. We don't need someone saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. We need someone who's willing to speak the truth of God's word, Stand on the truth of God's word. Call out the error whenever it's been spoken or when someone's living it. That's right. Because God says, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. Now, go back to Matthew chapter 5. Because Satan's at work and so let me help make peace. Satan can work even in that message that I just spoke. And so I need to be quick. And I need to be sure to make peace amongst us with that message. Because what we can do in the flesh is we can begin to say, all right, I've been wanting to say something to somebody. And in our flesh, in our pride, and our arrogance, we go and we say words that might be words of truth, but not in the spirit of truth. And therefore, we're not being a peacemaker. We're being a troublemaker, even though we might be speaking things that are words of truth. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 5. Go again to verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, I believe in this passage of Scripture, and I believe all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and so I believe likewise in this passage of Scripture, God's inspired word here, there's an order and a purpose to the way Jesus Christ teaches this lesson. And so the peacemaker, if you'll look on down, that's, ninth, that's the ninth verse. That's probably like one, that's about the seventh or eighth verse of the Beatitudes that God gives. Look at the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? Blessed are those that are humble. You can't be a peacemaker without humility. Or verse 4, Blessed are they that shall mourn, for they shall be comforted. You can't be a peacemaker without humility and without the proper kind of grief that we ought to have as Christians for the sin that's abounding around us in our own lives. It's not an arrogance about the sin. We can work in arrogance and call out sin. And we can flip over very quickly to Matthew chapter 7 where, Je where Jesus says, first cast that beam out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly how to cast the, the mote out of your brother's eye. But with humility, with grief over what God's word calls sin. And then in verse 5, blessed are the meek with meekness, power, and understanding, yet with the discipline to execute and to do and to say so that Christ is glorified and not me. So that, so that healing really takes place in the heart of someone, not just a cutting of the heart. And then it goes on, it says, they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's, the, it's our hungering and our thirsting after righteousness, not my own satisfaction because I've been wanting to say something to somebody, but the humility and the grief and the meekness and the desire for truth for Jesus Christ and then it goes on and it says those that are merciful those that are pure so you can't be a peacemaker 
if we're not operating in these other attributes that a Christian ought to operate in as well. If we take out one of these ingredients, if we take out mercy, and we begin to speak truth to someone, and we're not merciful in that truth, how quickly can Satan turn that around and say, well, you've got a sin in your own life that you... Satan can flip it very quickly. But out of an attitude, out of a heart of, of mercy, out of a pureness, and that pureness sometimes is just recognizing, I also am a sinner. Yes, I am. I come and I sit down and I talk with you. I recognize that I am a sinner even in that. But my sin doesn't negate the truth of God's Word. And as I try to walk and to live in accordance with God's Word, and as we do that together, there's going to create peace in that. Satan flip it around and say, well, you're a sinner. And so you can't make peace in anybody's life until you're pure yourself. And then Satan elevates the idea of purity far above what God's Word does to make you ineffective in any kind of ministry ever again. And then he goes on and he says, Blessed are the peacemakers. At peacemaking, I didn't count them just then at 7th and 8th on that list of things that God's Word gives. But I want to close with this talk, thought about it because the next thing that comes after it is the biggest barrier, I believe, to us being peacemakers. Look at what it says in verse 10. So verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The righteousness that we can produce, if we look in this passage of Scripture that I'm talking about, is that peacemaking. And peacemaking being a function of those other things that's contained in the first eight verses there. And whenever you go about making peace with someone that you love dearly and who loves you dearly, and yet you need to make peace, sometimes they're not going to like you. Their feelings are hurt. Our goal is not for everybody just to get along. That should never be our goal as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, that everybody might get along. And I must be prepared and understand plainly that when I go about my father's business, when I'm willing to speak and to say, to live a life in accordance with God's word, and not ignore it when it's being rejected all around me, because God's word applies to me, and it applies to you here in the house of God and out on the street, in our own homes and in our workplace. We don't segment God out of our life. And so whenever we're at church, we begin to behave one way. And when we're in our workplace, we behave a completely different way. That's not the life of a Christian. And whenever someone makes peace with that, they go about making peace and speaking the truth and, and, and walking through that with you and loving you enough that there might be real peace in your life if you're that person who chooses to be a peacemaker. You need to be prepared to know that you're going to be persecuted. Jesus Christ makes that plain all throughout God's Word, the New Testament. All those who will live righteously in Christ Jesus shall suffer for that. But there's a, there's a great peace in that because it's through the fellowship of the sufferings with Christ that we come to know Him and as we know Him, brethren, there is greater and greater peace. And as our brethren come to know Him through the suffering, there's greater and greater peace. There's a peace that this world gives. Jesus Christ says it. There's a peace that this world gives. And Christians today are all too often caught up in delivering that worldly peace. That peace is appeasement and avoidance it's emotions and feelings. It's the desire to have friendships over truth. It's not a peace that will last. And that friend will abandon you. But blessed are the peacemakers, the ones who go about as a follower of Jesus Christ, who are willing to speak what God's Word says, apply that Word of God to their own lives, and labor and work amongst one another that we all might apply it to our lives as well. Those are the peacemakers. And they, just in the closing, just like Christ did, they're the ones, they shall be called the children of God. I so desire to be a child of God. And in the context of that passage, I desire to be a child of God who makes peace. Not someone who creates death and destruction by doing nothing. That's my go-to in the flesh 
That's what I do in the flesh. When I see something going on somewhere, the easiest thing for me to do and to say is nothing. And I'm, I'm enabling, empowering, I don't know the right word on that, destruction in their life and in my own. But I desire to be a child of God who makes peace. May the grace of our Lord and Savior enable us and empower us to be peacemakers is my prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. When we walk